Welcome to the CWA Radio Network. You're listening to Amusing, hosted by me, Heather Randall. What if every thought is deeper than a daydream? What if it's a seedling from our Heavenly Father, our one true muse, pointing us to something we need to know? Let's embrace the freedom to wonder, take the invitation to explore, and learn everything he has to teach us in this amazing journey of life. Let's get this show started. Hello and happy Friday. You're listening to Amusing and this is episode 37. Today, as promised, we are talking about joy. Now through this week, I have been tested on my joy levels. Um, At the beginning of, or at the end of last week, I went into a doctor's appointment that was just supposed to be a quick check and ended up having emergency surgery the next day on my appendix. Um, Throughout the week, there were many opportunities where I wanted to complain and I wanted to um, express frustration and pain and um, all kinds of negativity. And when asked what I was talking about this week on my show, my response was stupid joy. I'm talking about stupid joy (laughs) because it wasn't at the beginning of this week. It was not something that I wanted to discuss. It wasn't something I was feeling. It was something I was continually working at. At one point, um, I had a really low day. I had a a lot of frustrations and a lot of reasons to complain, but instead I decided to look for gratitude and to note the ways that God had come through for me over the last week. And in doing that, it kind of woke up that joyful spirit in me and made me attentive to the fact that joy is a choice. So I've been studying joy and I'm ready to talk to you about it today. And we're not going to call it stupid anymore. Um, There are different definitions of joy within scripture, different versions of of the word. Um, And we're going to talk about that. I've looked at um, Strong's Concordance and and got an understanding of those. But first, I want to go through the points that I'm going to be making today. And that is that joy is a party. So we need to attend to joy. There should be a sound to joy. So we need to express joy audibly. There's an emotion of joy, so we need to feel that. Joy is an action, so we have to put movement to our joy. And then there's the ripple effect of joy. That's inspiring others toward joy. And there is a victory element to joy. We need to take back territory and banish the enemy by claiming and declaring our joy. So number one, attend joy. God wants us to experience joy as an event. He has built occasions for it into your life. Yes, I said occasions. This is a kind of joy that fills the senses. Think of a celebration or party you've attended. All of your senses are engaged in the event. You can taste the foods that have been prepared, smell the aroma of these delicacies, mixed with the perfumes and colognes of those in attendance. Maybe candles are lit to add to that ambiance. You hear sounds of laughing and pleasant conversation as guests enjoy each other's company. Perhaps music plays in the background. Cheers are made or songs sung. You can see the richness of the decorations, admire the size of the crowd. You can touch the velvet tablecloth, the latex squeak of the balloons, a friend's hand as they welcome you. It's a sensory explosion, and you are in it. The joy in the room touches every part of you. God wants you to party in him. Strong's number 1,524 in Hebrew is Galil, a revolution of time or an age that brings exceeding gladness and rejoicing. So this is a complete overturning of um, of a bad season, a bad time. It changes time. Psalm 43, 4 says, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and delight. This is how we overturn the age. This is how we bring revolution in our life, is by going to the altar of God, um, joying and delighting in him. 
It goes on to say, I will praise you with a lyre, O God, my God. The next example would be Strong's Concordance eight, number 8057, and that is Simcha, glee, exceeding gladness, mirth, pleasure, means to rejoice. It's a celebration, the party. It's predominantly, it's the predominant meaning of the word joy in the Old Testament. So you'll see this reference used a lot. First Samuel 18, 6, which is the first occasion of the word joy in scripture, says when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. This is a party. This is a celebration going on because David has just killed Goliath. In Esther 9.22, we can read, As the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration, he wrote to them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. This sounds like a party to me. Again, right? Isaiah 51, 11 says, Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Isaiah 29, 19 says, Once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Ecclesiastes 5, 20 says, They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Proverbs 15, 23 says, A person finds joy in giving an apt reply. And how good is a timely word? So when you give a good reply, there's literally a party on your tongue. Your timely word is a celebration coming out of your mouth. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. He is celebrating you. And all of these scriptures correlate with feast days and holy celebrations. It's important to celebrate the works of God in our lives. You know, some believers still don't choose to celebrate appointed times and feast days that are mentioned and even commanded in scripture. And they're missing out on experiencing this level of joy. I want you to think about this. If I have a friend and I call her up and say, hey, Will you come over to my house tonight for dinner? I've made a fantastic meal, and I just want to hang out with you and your family and just enjoy some time together. And she says, Oh, well, you know, I'm feeling kind of tired today. I really can't make it. Well, okay, I understand. Sometimes I'm tired too, right? So, you know, time goes by, and I call up the friend again and say, Hey, you know what? I am going to the mall today. I just want to hang out with you. You want to come? And she says, uh, oh, um, I can't. My child has a soccer game. Well, I'm going to go, okay, well, that's twice. But I'm going to keep trying because this friend matters to me. So the months go by, and maybe I call her up another day and say, hey, come on over. We are having, you know, game night at my house. Bring your favorite game, and we're going to just order pizza and just hang out. And she says, oh, well, I would, but... You know, and there's another excuse. And this goes on, and, and a pattern just repeats and repeats and repeats of me trying to make an effort with this friend and and connect with her. Maybe I've even gone so far to say, hey, you know, I'll meet you halfway, or I'm willing to show up at your house just to spend time with you. And again and again, I get a response like, oh, I can't this time. I get excuses. I get, you know, just that feeling that she's really not ever going to make time for me. Now, when a big event comes, like, I don't know, like my daughter's getting married, am I going to be inspired to send her an invitation when I know that all these little things that have come up 
you know, my ordinary day-to-day -day life and making room for her in it, she hasn't been excited about spending time with me. She hasn't wanted to be present. So am I going to invite her to that special occasion? Probably not. I'm, I'm not going to want to waste the money on the plate. Um, I'm not going to want to waste the card because really she's probably not going to come. I don't even know if I'm going to get an RSVP from her because half the time she just doesn't show. You know, when you have a relationship like that, it, it, it makes you not want to invite someone. And it's the same way with God. He invites us over and over and over again. Hey, come and be with me. Every week we have the Shabbat. We have the Sabbath day, right? We're supposed to be resting in him once a week. And if we're missing that opportunity to just be in his presence, if we're missing these, these appointed times in scripture that he's calling us toward him and we're giving excuses as to why we can't show up, and we're still expecting an invitation to the party, to the wedding feast, the wedding supper of the lamb. We still want that invitation. Oh, but don't, please don't call on me weekly. Please don't ask me to rest in your presence. I don't have time for that. Do you think you're going to get the invite? No, don't get me wrong here. You know, that person who can't make time for me because I'm loving and forgiving and people matter to me, I'm still probably going to consider her as a friend. And when she calls out to me or she calls me up and needs me, I'll probably be there, like in a heartbeat. And God is the same way. He'll still count you as his friend. He'll still show up for you and, and be there for you when you call on him. But he doesn't have that deep heart connection, that, that high level of friendship when you're not participating in life with him, when you're not coming to the, the party and joining in. And this is proven in scripture. Matthew 22, 1 through 14 says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that, they, that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed the, those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. We can also look at Luke 14, verse 15 through 24, and it says, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told a servant, Go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. There is no excuse grand enough. You were invited to a party in God's presence, friends. 
to experience joy in all your senses and in the depth of your soul. RSVP, yes. Don't turn down the opportunity to attend. Number two, express joy audibly. This was one of the first things that I noted when I started studying joy. So many scriptures link joy to singing and shouting, um, to musical instruments. We are told to make a joyful noise. Joy isn't silent. It isn't an emotion to hide. It's a feeling that begs to be heard. How many times have you received good news and not wanted to tell someone? Not likely, right? We want to shout it from the rooftop. We want the world to know our joy and to feel it with us. I have a daughter right now who is going for her driver's test. Now, I promise you when she returns home and walks through that door, if all went well, there will be screeching and screaming and jumping up and down and shouts of joy. It's going to be loud in my house. That's what joy sounds like. It has a sound. So Strong's, in Strong's Concordance, number 7,442 uh, 7, is Ronan. To creak or shout, it's that <coughs> sound, right? It's that squeak, it's that squee. To sing, to triumph, it's the effect or action of joy to make noise. Psalm 132 verse 9 says, May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. Psalm 132.16 says, I will clothe her priest with salvation and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Strong's Concordance number 7440 is Rinna. A creaking or shrill sound. I won't demonstrate a second time. It's a shout. It's a proclamation. Rejoice. Sing aloud. Triumph. An example of this is Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Psalm 32, 11 says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all of you who are upright in heart. Psalm 35, 27 says, May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. We were designed to make a joyful noise. This is how we were created to be. But you know, the enemy likes to sneak in and play mind games. I'm a new but huge fan of Brené Brown. If you haven't read any of her work or watched her TED Talks yet, you need to give them a shot. My copy of Dare to Lead is marked up so much that it's hard to read right now. In section three, the bottom of page 81, if you own the book, she writes, when we feel joy, it is a place of incredible vulnerability. It's beauty and fragility and deep gratitude and impermanence all wrapped up in one experience. When we can't tolerate that level of vulnerability, joy actually becomes foreboding and we immediately move to self-protection. This is incredibly sad and painfully true to me. I can't tell you how many times I've armored up at the first glimpse of joy on the horizon because, well, joy terrifies me. Instead of making noise, I go into a silent panic of what ifs. I imagine all the ways that moment could end, all the possibilities for that joy to be ripped away. Friends, this is a lie. Joy is a gift, it's opportunity, and it's a foolish, act to waste these moments bracing for others uh, for the other shoe to drop okay let's work to drop the armor resist the enemy whispering in our ears and embrace joy even if it does prove to be fleeting soak it up and wring it dry experience it to the fullest don't resist it vulnerability is power make your joy loud Number three, feel joy. Joy is going to affect your emotions. It's supposed to. Go ahead and feel it. It feels a lot like peace. 
Notice the cause of your joy and give praise to the source. The source of joy, if you didn't know, is the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit of our relationship with God and evidence of his presence in our lives. If you are feeling joy, you are recognizing God's activity in your life. He is working all things together for your good, and that feels delightful. It brings a calm, knowing that the best possible outcome is already in the works. You can rest in that truth. In Strong's Concordance, number 8,342, Sason means cheerfulness, welcome, gladness, mirth, and rejoicing. An example of this used in scripture is Jeremiah 31, 13. It says, Then young women will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. Number 2,898 is tube. It means good in the the widest sense, the best, most happy outcome. And that example is Isaiah 65, 14. It says, my servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts, but you will cry out from anguish of heart and wail in brokenness of spirit. So this is speaking to people apart from him. His servants will sing out of the joy of their hearts. This is who we want to be, right? We want to be his servants singing with joy. Number 5,479 is kara. It means cheerfulness and calm. And this is the predominant use of the word joy in the New Testament. In Luke 2, verse 10, it reads, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I am bringing you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. John 15, 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Complete, nothing lacking. John 16, 22 says, So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Galatians 5, 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24 says, Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. We work with you for your joy. These are people partnering for the sake of joy, to capture that feeling of joy in the body. Number four, put movement to your joy. Don't freeze, joy is physical. It's a workout. Move, dance, jump, spin, throw your head back in laughter, throw your hands in the air. Let your body commit this experience to memory through muscle movement. Feel the adrenaline and work those endorphins. Strong's Concordance number 1,523. Ghoul means to spin around under the influence of strong emotion. Picture a happy dance. And our example of this in scripture is Habakkuk 3.18. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Can you see the person spinning, twirling? Imagine, let's just, I'm just, Picture yourself just spinning around. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Number 21 in Strong's is Agaliao, to jump for joy. 1 Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice in as much as you participate in the suffering of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. When his glory is revealed, you're going to jump for joy. You're not going to be still. There is no stillness in his presence. Number five, inspire, those, inspire others to joy in the Lord. Inspire others to joy in the Lord. 
Notice those around you who struggle to feel joy, to experience joy in all of its forms, and be an encouragement to them. Be genuine and gentle, though. Do not condemn as Job's friends did. Example joy. Lead others to notice their blessings. Be a cheerful influence. Let them see you when you struggle. And model joy in those times in a way that makes others take note of your faith and want what you have. Number 8055, Samak, means to brighten up, to cheer up. This is the act of encouragement. Isaiah 9, 3 says, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. We should be people enlarging the nation and increasing the joy within the body of Christ. Number six, take back territory and banish the enemy by claiming and declaring your joy. One of the things that I was amazed by in my study was that shouts of victory in the ancient Near East were actually a sort of ceremonial claiming of land upon capture. The noise would send the enemy running and advertise to those around that there was a new sheriff in town. This declaration of joy was a notice of ownership and victory. Think about it. If the warriors won the battle but stayed silent, the enemy may believe some were wounded, perhaps dead. Maybe they would return thinking that victory had not yet been claimed. The cries of victory were an expression of joy that told the enemy they didn't stand a chance. This noise caused the enemy to retreat in fear. We see this in Strong's Concordance, number 8,643. Teruah, clamor, acclamation, or joy of a battle cry. It's the sound or alarm of the enemy, or to the enemy, and victory to the warrior. Psalm 27, 6 says, then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. And that is what God has brought me through this week. This is the point that I'm at right now. I am sacrificing with shouts of joy. I am singing and making music to the Lord. Because even though the enemies surrounded me, God has been good. When God has put you through war, when you have been tested and tried, the instinct is to sit down and take a breather and rest, to lick the wounds and move on slowly, to limp on toward the next crisis, to walk in defeat, even though you survive the battle. God does not want his children living this way. We are to walk in victory, to declare our joy to the world. We are more than conquerors through him. The enemy doesn't stand a chance. Get bold when God has taken you through dark valleys. Shout for joy that he walked with you through the valley of the shadow of death and delivered you into life abundant. Declare the victories in your life. Give testimony. Now through the summer months, I will be breaking from my usual format as a solo host to interview some amazing guests eager to testify to God's fingerprint in their lives. If you would like to chat with me as a guest, please visit www.heatherrandall.com forward slash podcast guests and fill out the guest request form. Next week, I'll be talking with Julie Plagans as she testifies to God's amazing work in her family. Don't miss it. Thanks for tuning in today. If you liked what you heard, please tell a friend and please subscribe on iTunes. Also, look for me online at heatherrandall.com and connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Till next time, I'm Heather Randall and this is Amusing.